And we're continuing on, continuing on with another example of the p-value approach to a hypothesis test for a mean. For this example, we are looking at a study done in 2015 where the mean number of text messages sent and received by teenagers daily was 5,000. Another researcher wants to dispute this claim to see if the mean is different from 5,000. A random sample of 100 teenagers yielded a sample mean of 5,350 texts with a standard deviation of 1,500. Perform the hypothesis test with a level of significance of 0 0.10. So starting off again, I'm going to underline all of the important pieces of information. So in the previous study, the mean number of text messages sent and received was 5,000. The researcher wants to see if the mean is actually different from 5,000. So they took a random sample of 100 teenagers, which yielded a sample mean of 5,350 texts. I'm going to re-highlight that. And a standard deviation of 1,500. We're doing a hypothesis test at a level of significance of 0 0.10. Here we go, moving into writing down all the important numbers. So 5,100, 5,350, 1,500, and 0 0.10. So the easy one to identify is 0.10. That's our level of significance, which will always be alpha. Another one that I find easy to identify is the sample size. That's how many people they sampled. That was 100, so that's N. The sample mean of 5,350, that would be X bar. And the standard deviation of 1,500 is S. So that leaves 5,000 to be mu. And again, 5,000 is the prior information we're being presented with. So that's going to be what we are assuming is the population mean. So the null and alternative is the first step. Null starts with an HO and is always going to be the parameter mu. It's always going to be equal. It's not always going to be mu, but it's always going to be the parameter, which in this case is mu because we're looking at means. It's always equal to because we're assuming that the parameter is equal to whatever value it is that we have been given, which in this case is 5,000. And then the alternative would be mu is different from 5,000. So that's going to be the not equal to. So that makes this a two-tailed test. Because the alternative is not equal to. So now step two, I'm going to find my test statistic. That's going to be our t-score, which is x bar minus mu divided by s over the square root of n. So again, this is why I like writing everything out at the beginning because I've identified all of these values. So I don't have to go hunting through the problem to try and figure them out now. I can just look at what I've identified already. And I can see what I've got. So the top becomes 350 
and the bottom, whoops, whoops, is one, nope, 150. So our T score is 2.3 repeating. We can just write down four of those threes. So 2.3333333. And again, I'm finding this first by hand, not in Excel. But I could use Excel. So the third step is to find the p-value. And again, just like with the right tail test, Excel has a built-in way for us to be able to do the two-tailed test. When we go into Excel, we're going to do equals t.dist.2 T, and I'm gonna do it over here off to the side. So equals t dot dist dot two t. Now the first thing I'm gonna enter is the t score two point three three. Oops, it's not typing over here. Two point three 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 three, comma. And then the second thing we want to give it are the degrees of freedom. So remember the degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1. So Rn was 100. That means our degrees of freedom is 99. And that tells Excel which t distribution to use. And we hit enter and we get 0 0.0217. Another thing to remember about this function, this one is a little bit picky. If this number turned out to be negative, if your test statistic was negative, you must plug in the positive value. And just like the normal distribution, the T distribution is symmetric. So when we do a two-tailed test, we're looking at everything below the negative and everything above the positive of the same T score. And I went over that in the notes for how to do a two-tailed test with proportions. So the way, that it, the way that Excel is able to do this is it says just give me what the positive t-score would be and I'll take care of figuring out all the rest. So if your t-score was negative 2.3333333, all, you know, all of those, drop the negative plug in just the positive. So plug in the positive value. So when you go to use this function, when you're doing this by hand, if your t-score is negative and you have a two-tailed test, ignore the negative when you go to Excel. Otherwise, Excel is going to give you an error message. It's going to give you one of those number NUM errors because it's going to say, I don't know what this negative is. I don't know what to do with it. So we have our test statistic and we have our p-value. So let's go in really quickly and let's just double check that these are correct. We can check it with our inference workbook. Oh, maybe we can't. 
Um, let me try relaunching this. I don't know why it's saying it won't work. Maybe we'll be able to check this. Hang on just one second. I don't know why it's not... There we go. Okay. I fixed it. I don't know why it wasn't working. So this is 5,000 and 5,000. This is not equal to. This was 5,350. The standard deviation is 1,500 and we sampled 100 people and our alpha is 0 0.1. So T naught 2.33333, P value 0 0.0217. These T criticals, the negative 1.6604, positive, you can ignore those. That's using the other method for hypothesis testing that I'm not teaching you. So Excel gave us the same values. So we'll go ahead and do our conclusion and the interpretation. So the conclusion, ask yourself, is the p-value too small compared to the alpha? Is the p-value less than alpha? Are these results unlikely? Are they too unlikely? So is 0 0.0217 less than 0 0.10? Yes. So if your p-value is low, that's when you reject HO. So we are going to reject the null hypothesis. So coming back up here, I've rejected the null hypothesis. So this guy is false. This guy is true. I was able to make my claim true. I was able to prove my claim. I did not make it true. I proved it. Mathematically, I was able to prove it. So now my interpretation on what this means, reject the null, what does that mean? It means we have enough evidence to claim that the mean number of text messages sent and received daily woo, by teens is different from 5,000. Or you could also have said is not 5,000 or is not equal to 5,000. Those are all different ways to say it. Even though my sample resulted in a number that was larger than 5,000, I cannot say it's larger. That's not what I was testing. I was testing, is it different? 
So that's the only thing I can claim. All I can claim in my alternative is, or in my conclusion, is whatever I was trying to claim in the alternative. My alternative says mu is not equal to 5,000. So my interpretation has to say that mu, which is the mean number of texts sent and received daily by teens, is not equal to 5,000, is different from 5,000. And that's how you do a two-tailed test.